An evolution professor is calling Michael Behe a liar for questioning evolution. The evolution professor says the causes of evolution are obvious and compelling. Well, what are those causes? In my previous video, I looked at horizontal gene transfer. It was one of the causes cited by the evolution professor. Well, it failed badly. In fact, it is a problem for evolution, as I discussed in my previous video. Now, the evolution professor also discusses several examples of evolution he claims are obvious and compelling. No question about it. So in this video, I'm going to look at one of those examples, batwing evolution. Right, so if you were to Google, if you were going on Google Scholar or something, right, and you were to look up batwing evolution, you know, how do wings evolve? How did whales evolve to be marine? You're going to find literal books answering those questions. Now, the evolution professor does not give references to back up his claims, but I would love to find such causes for the origin of species and, for example, bat wings. So off to Google Scholar we go. Bat wing evolution. And look at all these hits, thousands of hits. Let's have a look at some of these. How to grow a bat wing out of this volume from 2013. The earliest bats underwent an extraordinary limb to wing transition during their evolutionary history and successfully colonized the aerial habitat. Okay. Unfortunately, the bat fossil record lacks transitional fossils documenting this event, thereby challenging scientists to reconstruct these changes. Bat limb development is unique in its formation of a novel limb pattern, wing membrane, and elongated digits, not to mention connective tissue, nerves for sensing and controlling the wings, a central nervous system and brain for commanding the, uh, the flight, and coordination of the flight with the bat's echolocation capabilities that mini bats have for a fantastically complex and efficient aerial capability. Okay, let's look at another volume the evolution professor may have cited. This one from 2023. It talks about the different membranes, and I'll switch to this figure here. You can see these different membranes that the bat has the, between its neck and the forelimb. This forelimb is what's going to be the wing. Uh, between the digits of the forelimb, between the forelimb and the body, and then down there at the hind limb and the body. So four different types of membranes that the bat has. How did those evolve? Of these, the proplagio and europatagia do not have apparent homologs in other animals. So in other words, these are novel. These are unique to the bat. Common descent isn't going to help us here. And neither will the fossil record. The paleontological origins of novel bat wing membranes also remain mysterious. Wing membranes were clearly fully formed in the oldest fossilized bat skeletons from the early Eocene, about 52 and a half million years ago, and no transitional fossil forms between bats and their ancestors have been uncovered. Now there's another nice little figure of the different membranes. And back to this figure here. So these three that are circled do not have homologous uh, membranes and other species. So they are unique. They're novel to the bat. So we're already running very quickly. We're running into some problems here. First of all, the oldest fossils are the same as today. No evolution is evident in the fossil record. What we're seeing is stasis. Number two, the limb pattern, wing membrane, and elongated digits are all mostly novel. And three, there are unique embryonic development pathways. We'll see more of this. Well, let's move on now. Here's a paper, Development of Bat Flight. What does it say? Because of the similarity between the forelimb digits of the earliest preserved and modern bats, the fossil record currently can provide little evidence of the evolutionary transitions that led to the elongation of bat forelimb digits and the associated evolution of powered flight in mammals. The fossil record, as well as molecular clock studies, suggest that bats achieved powered flight in a few million years, which is a relatively short span of geologic time. Yes, indeed. So we have another problem cropping up. The bat wing, with all that that entails, must have evolved rapidly. Moving on, 
The great evolutionary success of bats can be attributed in large part to their achievement of powered flight. Bat-powered flight is made possible by several key morphological innovations, one of the most crucial being the elongation of the forelimb digits to support the wing membrane. Our morphometric analyses indicate that the relative lengths of these bat digits have not significantly changed since the time when bats were first fossilized over 50 million years ago. Therefore, little knowledge regarding one of the key morphological transitions in mammalian evolutionary history, that of the elongation of bat forelimb digits to support the wing membrane, can currently be gleaned from the fossil record. So again, we're not seeing it in the fossil record. And here's a nice figure of that. Uh, on the right there, you see an extant bat, and you can see the elongated digits on, of the forelimb. On the left, you see a fossilized example, a nice fossil uh, bat a wing showing that same sort of structure. Okay, well, let's move on to another paper. Understanding of bat wing evolution takes flight. Okay. In The Origin of Species, Charles Darwin recognized that the most serious challenge to his new theory of natural selection was its inability to explain the apparent sudden emergence of evolutionary novelty in the fossil record. And he appreciated the evolution of flight by bats to be one such problematic example. Without a series of intermediate forms to draw on, it is extremely hard to imagine how such perfected structures as the bat wing could arise de novo via accumulation of small selected changes. This theme was developed as a central critique by perhaps the most formidable of Darwin's contemporary critics, St. George Mivart. The incompetency of natural selection is what Mivart talked about. What good is 2% of a wing, was the old saying. Well, we can update that for today. What good is elongation of the forelimb skeleton without concomitant reduction in cortical thickness of the bones, rerouted innervation, etc.? If the fossil records similarly provided intermediate forms, in the evolution of bats, we might be able to appreciate the utility of the partial changes that led up to the formation of the modern bat wing as well. However, the ancestors of modern bats that first appear in the fossil record about 50 million years ago during the Eocene already have elongated digits, extensive interdigital membranes, and robust anterior forelimb muscles indicative of powered flight. This has led to speculation that the bat evolution occurred rapidly. Okay, well, let's move on to another paper. So far, we're just finding problems with this idea. Uh, here's a really good paper, uh, relatively recent. Um, it's a review paper on the evolution of the bat, making of a bat. Uh, it's by authors from the University of California, Los Angeles, and the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. However, the lack of fossils capturing the transition from terrestrial mammal to flying bat has obscured much of our understanding of bat evolution. Again, the fossil problem. The oldest known bat fossils date from the early Eocene approximately 52 and a half million years ago. These fossils already bear remarkable morphological similarities with extant bats, and when alive, the animals were likely capable of powered flight. Due to this dearth of transitional paleontological information, many researchers have begun utilizing studies of bat development and phylogenetic relationships to better understand the origin of bats and how they came to occupy such a diverse array of niches. Okay, now let me, let me stop for a second and explain this in English. This is where we're finally drilling down and we need to understand this. This is key quote here, bat development and phylogenetic relationships to better understand the origin of bats. They're going to focus in on bat development, that is embryonic development pathways, and phylogenetic relationships and the genes. So what is exactly going on? I'm gonna explain this right now in English. First, they compare the genes and embryonic development pathways of the bat wing with the bat hind limb, the mouse, forelimb, birds, etc. And then they're going to find differences in the bat and bat wing from these other examples. What are the differences? Of course, there's going to be differences because the bat wing is quite different, right? They are then, here's the key step. After finding those differences, they're going to ascribe them to evolution. Whatever they find in terms of the embryonic development pathways, 
or the genetics, they're going to ascribe those to evolution. Look what evolution did. So they're going to conclude that we are learning a great deal about bat wing evolution. And then people like the, the evolution professor can call Behe a liar for not acknowledging all the great progress being made in evolutionary theory. This is how it works. So we have another problem here, in case it wasn't obvious, it's circular. Evolutionary explanations are circular. Let's skip back here, back to this slide explaining what's going on. They're assuming evolution happened to begin with. That should be obvious. So whatever they find, okay, they chalk that up to evolution. Whatever changes are in the bat wing, oh, they evolved. That's evolution. Now we know how evolution works. So it's circular. So problem number five, evolutionary explanations are circular. Skipping down, morphometric analysis of the forelimb elements of fossil and extant bats suggests that the relative length of bat forelimbs and digits has not significantly changed in 50 million years. That's what the data are telling us. That's the empirical data. With clues to the origin of bat wing structures currently lacking in the fossil record, some studies have turned to developmental mechanisms to try to understand this transition, often using comparisons of bat and the mouse limb. Okay, so that's what I just mentioned a, a minute ago. They're repeating this idea. They're going to go look at the embryonic development pathways as well as the genomes and the phylogenetic relationships. At the time of the initial cartilaginous condensation of the digits, the future skeletal elements of the bat in the bat and mice forelimb are similar in size. However, rates of chondrocyte proliferation and differentiation soon increase notably in bat long bones, and the long bones increase in relative length. Aha! So they've found an embryonic difference. Moving on. Moving along, the result is that the final relative size of the bat forelimb, including the digits, is larger than that of the ancestral terrestrial mammals. Well, yes, of course. So, aha, embryonic differences. The apical ectodermal ridge and the zone of polarizing activity are up to three times larger in the developing limb buds of bats than those of mice. Aha, another embryonic difference. By the limb paddle stage, when the developing limb resembles a paddle, SHH expression is turned off in both bats and mice. However, SHH expression is later reinitiated in bats, but not in mice. So we have another embryonic uh, development pathway difference. Both the prolonged expression and the larger expression domains of these genes are believed to ultimately contribute to limb enlargement and digit lengthening. Aha, another embryonic difference. Several genes with unique expression levels in the bat wing relative to the bat hind limb and mouse forelimbs. Aha, another embryonic uh, development pathway difference. So they're finding all these differences. They're going to chalk those up to evolution. Look, we found out what evolution did. Skipping down. Because the protein coding regions of most patterning genes with important roles in limb development appear to be what? Largely conserved across bats and other mammals, it is likely that many, if not most, of the morphological specializations of the bat wing have evolved through changes in gene regulation. Okay, translate that to English. The genes that build things, that, that build the wing, have not changed in the bat the regulation of those genes is probably what is changing. Well, okay, that makes sense. But look at the serendipity all of a sudden that's being invoked in evolutionary theory. Instead, so, so it's like if you have a factory that makes bicycles, and then you have another factory that makes jet airplanes, and you find out, oh, they have, they're, they're all the same um, tools and the, the same uh, raw uh, equipment. The raw parts. Uh, this bolt here that we use for the bicycles, oh, we can also use that for jet airplanes. We don't need any changes, any new uh, parts. We just need to have different regulation of the machines. How lucky would that be? How unrealistic would that be? That's what is being called upon here. If evolution is true, wow, what luck. It just happened to have evolved all of these genes 
for making you know rodents and things and then voila they all worked for for bats as well though so that's a, a tremendous serendipity that they're invoking so problem number six serendipity structural proteins already present now the bat flight as i mentioned briefly earlier is sophisticated and advanced and here we have a, a mention of that. The functional combination of membrane tension and elasticity has allowed for unparalleled flight capability in bats. Skipping down, of the four membranes of the bat wing, only one, the dactylopatagium, has an obvious homology in non-bat mammals, while the other three are seemingly novel traits. Again, repeating what we talked about earlier. No common descent here. Common descent is not happen, is not helping. So much of what we're observing, uh, in this case, these three mem different membranes uh, in the bat are unique, novel to the bat. They had to have all arisen to create the bat flight. Beyond the developmental origins of the dactylopatagium, the developmental processes leading to the formation of the patagia and their subsequent diversification into a multitude of sizes and shapes remains what? Largely unknown. So there are no homologous pathways. They just evolved somehow. This is, oh, okay, they just evolved and we really don't understand how that happened. This isn't looking that good. Skipping down, as truly novel structures, the patagia beyond the dactylopatagia lack any known homology within mammals. Again, they all just, uh, these novel, unique structures all arose at the same time to support bat flight. Now here the paper is stepping back and admitting the evolution of novel traits is what? An outstanding question in evolutionary biology. Now outstanding question doesn't mean really great question. It means an unknown. The evolution of novel traits is an outstanding question in evolutionary biology. It's an unknown. This is not a example of evolution that is a slam dunk. Not an uh, example as the evolution professor uh, insisted that would be so obvious if you just simply go to Google Scholar it will all be obvious. That's not at all the case. In fact we're running into a series of major problems. So let's review these bat wing evolution problems again from the top. The oldest fossils are the same as today. No evolution is evident in the fossil record. The limb pattern, wing membranes, elongated digits are all mostly novel. The bat also has unique embryonic development pathways. The bat wing, with all that that entails, is likely to have evolved rapidly. The evolutionary explanations for all of this are circular. They begin with the assumption of evolution. There is serendipity in the evolutionary explanations. And the evolution of novel traits, this is stepping back, the evolution of novel traits in general is an unsolved problem. So they admit the evolution of novel traits is an unsolved problem, which is what Behe said. But wait, moving down to the conclusion section, suddenly it's triumphant. In this review, we have provided an overview of how evolution and development have molded some of the most unique morphological specializations of bats. Well, wait a minute, you could have fooled me. Where was that? I didn't see descriptions, or explanations, details, or even an overview of how evolution molded some of the most unique morphological specializations of bats. Well, again, of course, this is all circular. They're assuming the bat evolved to begin with, and then any differences they observe between other examples, well, that's what evolution did. So there, so there. We provided an overview of how evolution works. There you have it. And so then the evolution professor can claim that evolution is solved. Right, so if you were to Google, if you were going on Google Scholar or something, right, and you were to look up bat wing evolution, you know, how do wings evolve? How did whales evolve to be marine? You're going to find literal books answering those questions.